significance in evaluation of inferior T wave inversion. Now, we've heard very clearly from Professor Pelliccia that lateral T wave inversion does warrant further evaluation and is strongly associated with cardiomyopathies, particularly hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We are going to hear, and it's a talk that we're all looking forward to, from Professor Sanjay Sharma, who will elaborate on the implications of anterior T-wave invasion, and particularly its association with cardiomyopathies such as ARVC. So I have the pleasure, sandwiched between these two stalwarts of sports cardiology, to talk about inferior T-wave invasion. But I do have one advantage, and that is that the significance is as yet unclear particularly when one considers whether the T-wave inversions are limited to three inferior territory leads. And according to the international recommendations, such a pattern would warrant further investigation. Historically, however, that hasn't always been the case. And when present in just two leads, the international recommendations and Seattle recommendations that preceded these would deem this normal, which is a change from the original ESC 2010 guidelines that deemed this particular pattern abnormal. Therefore, there is a paradigm shift in our understanding. But what actually is the prevalence of isolated inferior T-wave inversion? And we published our experiences of over 11,000 adolescent athletes and found that the prevalence sat at 0.5% for white athletes, all footballers, and 1.3% of black athletes, and these were at the age of 16 and a half years old. And when we compare this to Michael Papadakis's paper of nearly 2,000 white athletes and over 900 black athletes, the prevalence was actually higher in Michael's experience. The black athletes were older and demonstrated a prevalence of 6%, perhaps suggesting that there may be an age-dependent physiological variation with exercise intensity and duration that was related to this. But I'd like to share some more contemporary data um, from our group, and it was led by a colleague, Michael Waite, who has helped describe the prevalence and investigation of T-wave inversions in cardiac risk in the young cohort. And we'll go on to discuss the distribution and morphology of the inferior T-wave inversion. So there were over 14,500 individuals who were involved in the CRI screening program, comprising a third of athletes and over 10,000 non-athletes. They underwent, as per protocol, a health questionnaire, an ECG, and a consultation, and referred for further investigations as deemed necessary by the CRI cardiology fellow. The results were compared to a cohort of 640 patients diagnosed with cardiomyopathy through our tertiary centre, comprising mainly of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but there were 72 cases of ARVC and 62 cases of non-compaction. T-wave inversion was considered significant if present in more than one millimeter of at least two inferior leads and deep if more than two millimeters. And then there was a group of type two ECG anomalies, i.e. subtle findings that may also indicate pathology. Some of these type 2 findings are included in the borderline ECG findings of the international recommendations, which, occurring in, if occurring in isolation, may be deemed normal, but if two or more occur, then that would warrant further investigation. But these type 2 patterns that I'm referring to do comprise not just the borderline ECG pattern, but also more subtle features of cardiomyopathy. And this table shows that the, general, um, the, the, the average age of the athletes was slightly more than the non-athletes, but the cardiomyopathy patients were much, much older. The majority of patients were male, and also, whilst 1% of non-athletes were, were of black ethnicity, and we know that there is more T-wave invasion associated with their ECGs, 22% um, of athletes um, were comprised of black origin, and over a third were the cardiomyopathy patients. And that probably reflects our selection population down at St. George's Hospital. And this histogram demonstrates the prevalence of T-wave inversion according to the inferior leads. And non-athletes demonstrated a prevalence of 0.8%, and that went up to 1.9% amongst athletes and 4.1% amongst those with cardiomyopathy. And if we break it down into gender, males demonstrated more inferior T-wave inversion than females, 
and unsurprisingly, black athletes demonstrated more T-wave inversion at 2.8% compared to white athletes at 1.6%. And looking further into the distribution of the T-waves, this histogram shows that the majority of T-wave inversion was actually confined to just two leads highlighted by the blue bars in all three sets of population, but was more prevalent in over a third of patients with cardiomyopathy, um, with cardiomyopathy in 2, 3, and ABF, i.e. involving all three leads of the inferior territory. And this distribution demonstrates the proportion of deep T-wave inversions, which was unsurprisingly higher amongst cardiomyopathy patients. This final histogram demonstrates the other ECG anomalies, those other more subtle features of um, potential cardiomyopathy, which was much more um, prevalent amongst cardiomyopathy patients, followed by athletes, as we would expect, and that was part of the reason why the borderline criteria were devised, because atrial enlargement and axis deviation in isolation could be deemed normal when compared to non-athletes. But there are concerns relating to the increasing false negative role, and there's a tendency to sometimes disregard borderline ECG changes when present in isolation. And athletes tend to have a more benign ECG pattern, such as right ventricular hypertrophy and atrial enlargement and bundle right bundle branch block, whereas cardiomyopathy patients tend to have more malignant type 2 ECG changes, such as Q waves, ST depression, and left bundle branch block. And when we apply historical and contemporary ECG criteria, I'd just like to um, re-emphasize that abnormal inferior T-wave inversion is considered in two of the um, inferior territory leads according to the ESC criteria. The Seattle actually took all three inferior leads um, as having T-wave inversion being abnormal, and the international criteria was slightly more pragmatic in taking all three inferior leads as abnormal and warranting further evaluation if only two or more of those borderline changes were present. And this histogram, um, or, or sorry, or this flowchart demonstrates the performance of each ECG criteria, both in terms of, on your right, the false positive rate, i.e. out of the 4,500 athletes, inferior T-wave inversion would have been flagged up according to the SE criteria in 87 of them, but the cardiomyopathy patients subjected to the same criteria would have all been detected, giving a very good false negative rate. The Seattle criteria would have actually only identified those 19 with inferior T-wave invasion all three leads, plus 12 more with abnormalities flagged up because of a type 2 ECG anomaly, slightly raising the false positive rate to 0.7. Um, or, or rather re reducing it from the ESC, but raising the false negative rate because there would be five cases that would have been missed because T-wave inversion amongst the cardiomyopathy patients was only present in two leads. And therefore, those who did not demonstrate any type two changes would have been missed by the Seattle criteria. And finally, applying the international criteria, four more athletes would have been highlighted, reducing the false positive rate to 0.5%, but the international criteria would have missed those cardiomyopathy patients who had inferior T-wave inversion in three and AVF only and had benign type 2 ECG patterns leading to a false, a false negative rate of 1.4%. So there's a balance between identifying correctly those individuals who are harboring cardiomyopathy yet not creating unnecessary angst in terms of um, increasing the false positive rate. There was, in fact, one athlete diagnosed with T-wave inversion, to, and so to throw this into the melting pot, this individual had isolated T-wave inversion affecting three and AVF only in the absence of any other barn door type two ECG anomaly, and therefore would have arguably been missed. Three years later, according to um, a, a repeat screen and a repeat ECG, he had actually evolved um, in terms of T-wave invasion to incorporate all three inferior lead territories. And that goes on to highlight the aforementioned point of serial surveillance playing a crucial role in identifying this individual. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, inferior T-wave inversion is associated with cardiomyopathy and was prevalent in 4% of the population that we studied. There's an increased preponderance amongst athletes, males, and those who are black. 
Other type two ECG changes, be it borderline or more subtle Q waves in ST depression should always be considered and taken into account. And it does raise the possibility that inferior T wave invasion, any two contiguous inferior leads should prompt further evaluation for quiescent cardiomyopathy. Thank you very much for your attention.